Welcome to Discover Bible Prophecy. Today we have another interesting prophecy to investigate. Today the prophecy we're looking at is the 70 week prophecy in Daniel 9. It's a sometimes called the seven sevens. It's a 490 year prophecy and it looks 490 years into the future from Daniel's time. My starting point for this prophecy is in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. So how did Jesus view Daniel? What did he say about Daniel? Well, Jesus called Daniel a prophet and treated his prophecies as predictions of future events. So Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet. So Jesus called Daniel a prophet. So what we're going to do now is go to chapter nine. And in chapter nine, we look down the road into the future with the 70 week prophecy that was given to Daniel. It describes a 490 year period of time that was given to the Jewish nation to repent of their sinful ways and it predicts the coming of the Messiah Jesus. So we'll be studying that in our lesson today. This is an interesting fact I thought I'd share with you. Uh, the United States was formed, formed in 1776. Now, as of this video that I'm recording, that was 241 years ago. So to give you a better perspective of what 490 years are, that's twice as long as the United States has been in existence as a country. So that's a very long prophecy that was given Daniel. So before we get started in this study, I have a couple things I want to share with you. First off, I'd like to mention what your job is for, for you in this video. What I want you to do is for you to do your own due diligence. Now, due diligence is a term uh, used in, for a process that involves the performance of an investigation, usually of a business or of a teaching with a certain degree of uh, care and seriousness. So I strongly recommend that you believe nothing I show you today, even though everything I show you, as far as I'm concerned, is true, but I want you to check on your own and investigate and see if what I am telling you is true. And we find that in the Bible also in Acts 17, 11, says now the Bereans, Berean Jews, were more noble in character. Why? Because even though they were listening to Paul and they believed Paul, they went and they examined the scriptures for themselves to see if what Paul said was true. Now, Paul wasn't lying to them. Uh, Paul was telling them the truth. But here in, the, in Acts, we find that these Bereans were more noble because they went to the Bible and they went to verify what Paul said was true. And that's what I'd like you to do. Don't believe anything I show you especially if it's new, but go to the Bible and I, you'll see lots of Bible text there and see if what I'm saying is true. One other thing. Now, this is a cute little dog here with big ears, but I'd like you to hear me out. In Proverbs, it says in 1813, it says to answer before listening. In other words, to answer before you hear what the person has to say, that is folly and shame. So, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. I have no problem with that. If you agree with me, that's fine also. But why don't you look at the whole presentation that I have here and see if there's any merit to it. Then you can critique it as much as you like. That would be great. So during the study, if you need clarification or you disagree with a point, you'll see that each page has a number on it. Here, like on this page, it's page number 15. So you can mark down that page, and in the section right below this uh, video, there's a place for comments. Reference the page, give me your comment or question, and I'll do my best to answer all questions.
How's that? Okay, let's get started. Now, we're going to start today by looking at God's calendar. Now, you may not be familiar with the term God's calendar, but I think some of this, uh, some of you will be familiar with. So to properly understand prophecy in Daniel 9, you must understand something about calendars. And they can be quite uh, complicated and confusing. So I'm going to give you as many illustrations as I can. And I, I don't want to go too deep in calendars, but only deep enough so that we can explain the scripture from them. So what are the calendars referenced in this study? Well, the first one is God's calendar, and it's called a spring to spring calendar. And these are the years in BC that were involved in here primarily in Daniel 9, in this 400, 300, 500 BC. In this time frame, God's calendar is what is referenced. Now, the second calendar that we'll touch on a little bit later on is what is called a Persian civil cal uh, calendar, and it's a fall-to-fall -fall calendar, and I'll explain that when we get to it. And then the third one is the calendar that most of us use around the world. Everybody uses this. It's called the Julian calendar. It's a winter-to-winter -winter calendar, and it went into effect in 45 B.C., so I'll tell you a little bit more about that here coming up. So the Julian calendar, that's what we use today. When a month starts and stops, that is because Julius Caesar wanted it to start and stop on those dates. When a year starts in January and ends in December, Julius Caesar wanted it that way. So he set up this calendar the way we use it today. So during his reign, he didn't like the variableness of God's calendar. And I'll show you how that variableness comes about here in a few minutes. But So he came up with this uh, Julian calendar, that's his name, and it went into effect in 45 BC. Now today, we still use this calendar with very slight modifications. Pope Gregory VIII, uh, we made a few little modifications to it so it would be more uh, accurate in terms of the leap years and things. Okay, how does God's calendar work? What is the first month in God's calendar? How is it determined? Well, if we go over here to Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2, we read, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So before they left Egypt, where they were... Uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, slaves in Egypt. Before they left Egypt, God told them, this month, and it's the first month is called Nisan, shall be unto you the beginnings of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. So Nisan is the first month of the year for the Jewish nation. This is the calendar that God set up as the Jews left Egypt. And here's how it works. In God's calendar, the first new moon, now a new moon is all dark. It's not all bright, it's all dark. So the first new moon after the spring equinox starts the first month of the year and it's called a Nisan. So here's how you determine the spring vernal equinox. This is the earth right here. When the earth and the moon are in direct alignment with the sun, when you look up towards the moon, the moon is entirely uh, blocking the sun. So there is no reflected sunlight coming off the moon back towards the earth. So the moon looks entirely dark, 100% dark. And that's what's represented here. This is a picture of the, of the uh, looking at the moon and it, where it blocks out the sun completely. So the moon is entirely dark. Now here are a bunch of phases of the moon. We're all familiar with that. Here's a new moon, and here you can see across the top, 
all the way down to 15 are the various crescents of the moon. Of course, when you get to the 15th month, that's called a full moon. And typically, this does vary a little bit from a new moon to a full moon is uh, typically 14 to 16 days. Now, because the new moon, you can't see it, it's all dark, there's nothing to see in the sky, it's very difficult to identify the exact day that it occurs. And this was difficult for the Jewish nation to determine that. Now, if we look in Wikipedia, the, some definitions here, it says the astronomical new moon, known as the dark moon, occurs at the moment of conjunction with the sun and the moon, where it's invisible from the earth. That's just what I told you already. Now, in non-astronomical terms, the new moon means that the first visible crescent of the moon. What this is really saying is the non-astronomical uh, terms, that's right here, when you can see a little sliver of light reflecting off the moon in number three here. And that's what the Jewish nation used uh, to determine the beginning of the month. They did not follow God's instructions. God instructed them to use the new moon, but they chose to use the first sliver uh, of the moon uh, when, when it's, you could see that. Okay, so this is an interesting fact and it does cause a lot of confusion on certain aspects of people studying the Bible, and I'll cover that slightly later on, all right? Now, we're going to look at some little more details here about calendars. Now, this is the Julian calendar. Like I said, it's a winter-to-winter -winter calendar. It has 12 months in it, 1 through 12. Starts with January, and in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously, January is winter. And it goes to November, which is also winter. So for the Northern Hemisphere, this is what you would call winter, spring, summer, and fall. These are the four seasons, the 10, 12 months of the year. Now, this is God's calendar. Now, God's calendar is a little more tricky. It has 12 months, and then every three years, every third year, they add a 13th month to get it synced up again with the, with the seasons. So God's calendar, you notice the first month here does not line up with the first month on the Julian calendar. They're different. So why and how are they different? Well, this is the rule that God set up. After the spring vernal equinox, that's the, what the first new moon you see, the first 100% dark moon, you look for that after the spring vernal equinox. And when that occurs, you declare that Nisan, the month of Nisan, has officially started. There are actually uh, people in the, in, in the, uh, the sanctuary uh, service or a sanctuary group of people that actually their job was to watch the moon and determine when it's Nisan one or the first of every month and they were officially declared it, the month has started. So this is important to remember. So I'm going to put a little, uh, a little sign here. It says, remember this as we go along. This is something that's important, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to add up as we go through. These important little things here are going to add up and give you a lot of understanding into this prophecy. So the first thing we want to say here is what year was the order to restore and rebuild Jerusalem given or issued? So what I'd like to do is to read you four Bible texts. This 70-week prophecy really consists of four Bible texts, 24, 25, 26, and 27. I just happen to have the New English version here. This reads about the same in any version. It doesn't really matter which version you use. So let me take a second here to read it. Now you notice there's some brackets in here. What I have done is added some commentary within the Bible text. 
so that it, you'll understand it a little clearer. And as I go through this uh, study, you can come back and look at these words that I've added, and you'll see that they are appropriate to explaining this Bible uh, prophecy. Okay, let me start here at verse 24. Seventy-seven years are decreed for your people, that's for the Jewish nation, and for your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. We'll be going through this in more detail as we go through the study, so I'm just going to read it now. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild, this is what we're going to start with our study, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one Jesus, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens. You'll find that that's 49 years. And 62 sevens, that's 434 years. It will, it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. All right, number 26, verse 26. After the 62 seven years, the anointed one, Jesus, will be put to death and will have nothing. The people, that is the Roman army of the ruler, Titus, who, whose end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. 27. He, Jesus, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, and in the middle of the seven, that's the seventh uh, year, 70th year, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So this is the text we're going to look into right now. It says, know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the city. So we want to find out what decree went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So remember those two key words as we look at the various texts that refer to this. So we find over the years that there are four different Bible texts that historians associate with the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So we're going to look at all four of these. Okay, this first one is quite popular. A lot of people think this is the correct one. It says, uh, and this is my words, by the way, so it's a, it's a little... A uh, bit descriptive here. The 536 to 538 BC decree. So the, the, the decree people reference is in that area usually. Of Cyrus in Ezra 1 gave instructions only for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. It said nothing about restoring Jerusalem itself. Okay, the second decree that you can find in Ezra 6, this reference is 519 BC. By the way, that's Julian calendar dates. So the 519 BC decree of Darius in, in Ezra 6 was simply his endorsement of the original decree of Cyrus, of this first decree. And it mentioned only the building of the house of, the, of God, the temple. All right, the third one in 457 BC, that decree from Artaxerxes in Ezra 7 refers to both the returning of Jerusalem to the theocratic state, in other words, rebuild the city and, and the rulership there, and restoring of the temple. And then the final one is in 444, 445, and there's a number of people that believe that this is the correct one. And it says, this decree of Nehemiah uh, too was a restatement of the Artaxerxes original authorization, number three here, this time naming Nehemiah to take charge of the project. So my evaluation of this is this. One, two, and four are not the proper 
uh, dates or the proper the reference decrees. And number three is, is the one that is the correct one. So I believe that the decree that went out in 457 BC is the correct Julian starting year for this prophecy. So I want to look a little more detail in King Artaxerxes' decree in 457 that ordered the restoration and the rebuild of Jerusalem. And now we're going to add in another calendar on you, confuse you just a little bit here, this Persian civil calendar. So let's add that in here. So we're going to start off with the Julian calendar, just like I showed you before. And we're going to add in God's calendar. That's a one year. So we got the Julian calendar on the bottom for our reference. And that's the only reason I'm putting this in here is for reference, because that's what we use today. The Julian calendar, when did I say it went into uh, effect? 45 BC. So this is 457 BC. This is 425 years before that. There was no Julian calendar when this decree went out. But we're using it here for reference so we, we can relate to it. All right, the Persian calendar was a civil calendar. And it went into effect in the seventh month of God's calendar. That's where it went into effect. And the, the uh, civil calendar was, was used at that time. There were two calendars in effect, God's calendar and the Persian civil calendar. Now, the Persian civil cal calendar starts at the seventh month of God's calendar, about September, October. And it's sort of like today's uh, business calendars that many companies keep. They don't want to end their year in December 31st because of holidays and a lot of paperwork that they have to do to end the business and start a new year. So they move it to the middle of the year when it's more convenient for them. So that's what this, this Persian civil calendar was all about. So we read here in Ezra 7.11, this is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes has given to Ezra the priest. You, Ezra, are to take with you on your trip to Jerusalem the silver and gold that the king and his advisors have freely given to the God of Israel. So we go on here on, in uh, verses uh, 18. You and your fellow Israelites may then do whatever seems best with the rest of the silver and gold in accordance with the will of your God and anything else needed for the temple of your God. You may provide from this royal treasury. So we want to find out when this order went out. So I, I, I kind of darkened in the, uh, the Julian calendar, so that won't affect us here. So we're going to start with Ezra 7, 8. It says, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on the fifth month of the year, and on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. So he began his journey on the first month, and he arrived on the fifth month. So in God's calendar, he started out in Nisan, the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the fifth month. Let's look at another, another text, Ezra 8, thir, uh, 31. On the twelfth day of the first month, that's right there, we set out from the canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So they, they left on the first, on the 12th day of the first month. So we have two references now to their starting of their journey to go to Jerusalem. But you might say, Art, how do I know that Ezra references the first month in God's spring to spring calendar and he's not referencing God's civil calendar over here. You know, why isn't this first month, this month right here, in the Persian calendar? Well, let's do more, more digging. Over in Ezra 6.19, it says, On the first day of the first month, first day of the first month, the exiles celebrated Passover. 
Now, when is Passover celebrated? Passover is always celebrated in the spring in Nisan. The first month of the civil calendar is in the fall. Do we really think that the Israelites would have celebrated Passover in September or October? Of course not. So these references in Ezra all are referring to God's calendar. So I think there's no evidence that's in the book of Ezra that changes the references from the spring to spring calendar to a fall to fall calendar. So I think the argument that some people make that the calendar was the Persian civil calendar is there's no grounds for that. It's God's calendar that was referenced. So my conclusion is this. In the spring of 457 BC is the year that the order was issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Stay tuned though, because I have additional evidence coming up that will strongly support the 457 year, totally independent from what I've shown you so far. And also, this is another key fact that I want you to remember as we go through our study here. Seven sevens, what is seven sevens? Well, we'll go back to our calendar here. And uh, we can see, I'm gonna put 457 here. That's Julian calendar. That's not a calendar they used back then. That's a calendar that we used. But I'm going to put that there. January to December, winter, spring, summer, fall, etc. And as the days or the years go towards the cross, the years, the numbers of the years decrease. 457, 456 BC. That's how it goes. It decreases towards the cross. And this is the this is God's calendar on the top. It's a spring to spring calendar. Starts with the first month called Nisan. Okay. And that is the first month of this prophecy. This is the calendar that God is referencing. This is the first year. I said month a second ago, but it's the first year of the 490 years of this prophecy. That's what's on top here. So what I'm going to do to simplify things a little bit, I'm going to cover up the bottom and the top. Did you notice that? I'm just going to cover them up, all the little details. So this is the Julian calendar. This is God's calendar. And I'm going to hide this other stuff here. So we're just going to look at this here, and you'll see how this will help us to to visualize this uh, prophecy as we examine it. But first I want to mention something to you. It says, no one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens. And you'll, I'll show you how that we get 49 years, but that's 49 years. And 62 sevens, that's 434 years. So to get the seven sevens, we use a prophecy key. And this is found in uh, Ezekiel 4, 6, and there's also an, another reference in the Bible to it. But seven weeks times seven days per week equals 49 days, using a one day equal one year key that we find in uh, Ezekiel, 49 days equals 49 years. So here are the simplified calendars that I just showed you. This is the year 457. And now we're going to go along the first week, the first seven years of this prophecy. First one year, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The first seven years. And you can see how the years decrease across here. We end up with 451. So this is the first week of the 70 weeks of the prophecy. So let's look at it this way. This whole block right here is the full 
length of the prophecy. Across the top is one week, that's seven years. In this direction is 70 weeks, and that'll add up to 40, 490 years. So this whole block of time is a 490-year block of time. That's what this prophecy covers, this amount of time, 490 years, okay? So this first week again, let's look at that. This first week is interesting. Did you notice that these seven years look like a jubilee week? Oh, you don't know what a jubilee week is? We're going to show you what the jubilee week is. Hold on. So in Leviticus 25, verses 1 to 5, this is God instructing Moses before they left Egypt. Speak to the Israelites when you enter the land. The land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. A year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. So do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows by of itself or harvest the grapes of your unintended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. So this is what God told Moses. So in, in a, a Jubilee week, the, the seventh year is a year of rest, a year of Sabbath rest. So that one must mean that in our terminology, the first year of the seven years must be a Sunday year. Now, the Bible doesn't call it a Sunday year. They don't call Sunday, Monday, Tuesday like that. The only day they identify is a Sabbath year, but we would call it a Sunday year. And it's also a Jubilee year. So do you know what a Jubilee year is? I'm going to show you that here in a second. So here's our first week. I just showed you that. And there's total of seven weeks here. This is seven sevens. So we're still using seven weeks times seven days per week is 49 days. Using the day for week key, 490 days is 490 years. That's what we're showing here. Daniel 29.25. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out, from, from what? From this time right here, from 457, we just found that out. From the time the word goes out to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one Jesus, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens, or that is 49 years. Seven sevens, 49 years. So this here is representative of the first 49 years in this prophecy. And it's also a jubilee cycle. Leviticus 25, verse 8, count off seven Sabbath years. Seven Sabbath years, okay? So let's count off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So each of the end of the week, that's a Sabbath year. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven. So that seven Sabbath years amounts to a jubilee period of 49 years. This is God's instructions. This is a 49-year jubilee cycle. And it all starts at 457 B.C. That's the key year that starts this prophecy off. Here's another thing I want you to remember. Keep these thoughts in your mind as we go through. 